thank you, Crow, and thank you all for nominating me and inviting me. I'm really honored to be in front of you. This is really a great way to come back to civilization of being together. Um, I can't imagine a group that I'd rather be with to celebrate sort of a great coming out party and coming together party. So thank you very much for inviting me here today. I really have no idea how long this talk is going to go. <laughs> I know folks want to get home. I want to get home too. But bear with me. I'll speed things up. I'll drop things out if I need to. But at the very end of the talk, I have a little kind of multiple choice final exam. Um, I did not ask people to upload any app that might be a clicker kind of app to their phones because I think those are spyware as often as <laughs> um, So we're just going to have a little multiple choice test at the end where you raise your hand. And you kind of got to close your eyes when you raise your hand so you're not cheating. Um, and then I just also wanted to say an observation after two and a half days that um, many things have inspired me about the subtitles under our talks. Um, I, really appreciate how much more accessible they make the talks to people with disabilities. Um, and one thing that I've really enjoyed is um, the opportunity to think of names I could have given my children. Um, because if you look at the way it translates genus and species names, it's incredibly creative. So at some point when you're really bored with your own talk that you're rehearsing, you should talk into your computer, into your PowerPoint show, and see how it translates genus and species names. One classic one yesterday, which I thought of it when we were naming one of our kids, was Ladia translates into Lydia. But that's just the beginning of <laughs> the way it translates certain words, and it's inspiring and it's entertaining, trust me. So I want to start by um, a huge insult to us as marine scientists, and that's Paul Cullenbow's opening quote in his book, Why Big Fierce Animals Are Rare. He describes the oceans as a vast des desert, desperately short of nutrients, and with living things spread most thinly through them. And for me, in pretty much my whole career, those have been fighting words. <laughs> and I hope that you, as my colleagues and friends and marine scientists, feel the same way. Now, before I start my talk, which is about the present, the past, and the future, in that deliberate order, I just need to thank so many of my colleagues and collaborators who are here today. You know who you are. Some of you aren't here. And also especially many of my former graduate students and postdoctoral fellows are here today. This is a panel of my former graduate students. Um, and this next one is a panel of my former postdoctoral fellows, um, many of whom um, are your mentors today or a lot of whom are mentors today, see if you can recognize them. And it's this diversity of people who have really enlightened my career, kept me motivated, and made me think about the spectacular diversity that life in the sea embodies, and made my pursuit of trying to understand it and broaden the perspectives that I use to try to understand it, really a great journey. And then I also especially want to start by thanking my friend and collaborator, Gary Vermey. Gary taught me something really interesting. Gary, as we all know, is blind. And he taught me to spend less time looking and more time listening, smelling, touching, and feeling what it's like to live in the sea. And that led to a remarkable collaboration. Um, collaboration is actually too strong a word for it. Um, Gary had all the good ideas and I was just sort of his mouthpiece and his writer and his reader. But we've worked on a series of problems that will form the first two thirds of the talk about the features of life in the ocean and the physical aspects of life in the ocean that seem to have shaped a lot of the distribution of both phyletic and species diversity and differences in phyletic species and species diversity in the land and the sea. And without him, I simply would not have had that past perspective in due time and the importance of looking back distantly in the past in order to understand patterns in the present and predict patterns into the future. So the overall scope for this is something that I think all of us as marine scientists need to do periodically and ask ourselves, is life really different in the sea? 
So if we compare, you know, for example, an Indonesian reef to Lake Malawi cichlids, how much do patterns of species diversity differ in a freshwater lake versus a tropical coral reef? Or if we care, compare patterns of species diversity in the California kelp forest, you know, before Pycnopodia died, to a Queensland rainforest, are they really <coughs> all that different? And those are the kinds of questions I want to explore in the first two thirds of the talk today. So I'm gonna start with the present. And the key question I want to focus on for this part of the talk is why are there so many more species on land than in the sea? Here are some of the hard facts. Oceans, as you all know, cover 70 to 71% of the Earth's surface. The total volume of the marine biosphere is probably about 100 times the volume of the terrestrial biosphere. But most of the ocean's volume, as you know, is deep and pelagic with relatively little primary productivity and most of that productivity is chemoautotrophic. And yet, at least now, macroscopic species diversity on land is vastly greater than that in the sea. Now, if we look at this problem of this comparison and compare land versus sea at the level of phyla, whatever phyla really are, and I just color-coded the, you know, the distribution of these phyla, land or terrestrial, and aerial and, um, and marine with blue and brown, and I'll do that throughout the talk. You can see basically that, in fact, all of the metazoan phyla, with the exception of one, namely the Anacophora or velvet worms, have representatives. All of them have representatives in the sea, except for the Anacophora. And there are only roughly 11 or 12 phyla that have representatives on land, and only one of them is exclusively terrestrial, and that's the velvet worms or Anacophora. So at the level of phyla, if you look at this in terms of a pie diagram, and if you believe in phyla, almost all are marine. And there's no question but all phyla originated in the sea. But what about macroscopic species diversity? And depending upon whether you believe in Bob May or Michael Benton in 2009, somewhere between 85 and 98% of all macroscopic species diversity is currently terrestrial, and only somewhere between two and a half, two and 15% is currently marine. If we look at this and break it down a little bit more in terms of metazoan consumers, only about 2% of the of metazoan consumers, or about 200,000 species, are marine, and yet we know there have been metazoan consumers in the sea for about 800 million years, plus or minus. And about 98%, or roughly 10 million species, plus or minus a few million, are associated with plants in terrestrial environments. And all that happened, all of that diversification, happened in less than half the time that life has been in the ocean. If we compare macroscopic primary producers, there are maybe 10,000 species, plus or minus, and probably 30,000 plus or minus of unicellular primary producers in the sea. Maybe about 2,000 species of, if you want to call them primary producers, nidarians, tunicates and, symbi and, tu tunicates and sponges that harbor photosymbionts um, that may represent primary producers. And there are roughly 300,000 species of macroscopic primary producers on land. Now, if we sort of just try and standardize this a little bit to the area available for primary production. Area, I realize, is a little bit of a misguided term. The area available to photosynthesizers on land versus sea is about 1 to 61.5. So in terms of surface area, there's about 60 times more area available to primary producers in the oceans than in the sea. And if we look at species diversity, of photosynthesizers on land versus sea. It's not quite the flip of the ratio, but it's pretty close, about 25 to 1. And if we add unicellular primary producers in the sea to that calculation, it declines to about 6 to 1. So even in the best case scenario, the species diversity, despite the fact that there's less area available for primary production, the species diversity of photosynthesizers on the land is about six times what it is in the sea. And if we compare micro versus macroscopic distribution of primary production, 
you all know that the overwhelming amount, although there is considerable coastal primary production, that's macroscopic in the sea. The vast majority of it is, of course, microscopic, and it's quite different in terrestrial environments, where the vast majority of primary production is macroscopic. Gross primary production in the sea is about 140 grams of carbon per square meter per year, whereas gross primary production on land is about 426 uh, grams of carbon per square meter per year. So about three and a half times what it is in the sea. So let's return to this question of why are there so many more species on land when the sea is so much bigger and when in fact life has been present in the sea multicellular life has been present in the sea for about twice as long as it has plants. So there's been more time in the sea for life to diversify. And there's more area there. Is it, what's the explanation? And that's the problem that Gary and I have been exploring for about the last decade. So let's just, you know, run through this list. This isn't, by the way, none of this is going to be on the exam. You don't have to ask me questions about this. It doesn't really matter whether you know you think the numbers are right, plus or minus 10%. If I'm wrong by 1,000%, it matters, and I want to hear about it. So if we just run through some of the most more diverse marine phyla, you know, sponges, about 9,000 species in the sea, cnidarians, about the same, nematodes, 35,000, there may be 10,000 undescribed species, we don't really know, annelids, 15,000. I don't mean to offend anybody who works on a particular taxonomic group here. This is not a measure of importance. Arthropods in the sea, about 200,000 species. Mollusks, about 190,000. Rhizome, and Gary, by the way, really got into an argument with me because he wanted mollusks to be more diverse than arthropods because he spent his career studying mollusks, but he just couldn't spin the data. Rhizomes, about 15,000 species, so that's pretty cool. Chordates, about 15,000 species, and most of them are, you know what, the fish. And then other random stuff, not random stuff, things that I work on, um, about 12,000 species. In terrestrial systems, there may be as many as a million species of fungi. Plants, about 300,000 species. Nematodes, way more than the ocean, close to a million species, perhaps more. Mites, you don't think about them as being all that mighty, but there are about 750,000. That was a joke, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> It just happened, too. I didn't, I didn't find that fun. Spiders, 170,000. That's an honor of Gary, by the way. For those of you who know Gary, he's a consummate punster. Mollusks, about 20,000 species. Mollusks are boring on land, which is why Gary's a marine now ecologist. Insects, 9 million species. You know, there may be a few more, a few less, but roughly that. Chordates, about 25,000 species. And other stuff, about 75,000 species. In any case, if you look at the totals, about 12, 12 million plus species on macroscopic species on land, about 500,000 in the sea. It's not good for the ocean in terms of species diversity in these days. Now, if we look at the biotic attributes of marine systems and terrestrial systems, and we compare their biotic ages, the sea is really old. There's been life in the sea for about three and a half billion years. Most of it, in fact, all of it microscopic, except for the last 800 billion years or so. Um, whereas the land and life on the land is relatively recent, about 500, 400 to 500 million years. The area, as we've always already said, of the sea is huge compared to that of the land, at least three times as big, plus or minus. In terms of number of phyla, 33 to 35, and the sea depends on how you count phyla, somewhere around 12 on land, only one of which is unique to the land. So all species, as we already said at the very beginning, roughly 5 to 50% of extant species diversity is marine, and the rest is terrestrial. Now, if we compare the most diverse hectares of land and sea that we can find, so in the sea, a hectare of tropical reef, there might be two to 300 species of corals, a few hundred species of algae, and a ton of fish. 500 to 600 species. If we compare the same rough area, a tropical hectare, an old tropical hectare on land, there might be 475 species of trees. There aren't trees in the ocean. About 25,000 species of insects. And you know, insects are crustaceans, for those of you who are into this. So you know, I mean, 
it's not a lot of crustaceans, and it's, but it's a lot of insects in that tropical hectare. That's not the total number of species, that's just in that tropical hectare. And two to 300 species in a hectare of a really diverse, say, African drift lake. If we look at microbial diversity, I just have question marks there. And I look to people who may still be here now, like Anya and Maggie, and other marine microbiologists, to help us better understand patterns of microbial diversity in terrestrial versus marine environments. But we're just beginning to unwrap that question. I'm far from an expert in it, so I'm going to stay away from it. Now, in terms of animal-mediated dispersal, if we compare marine to terrestrial environments, there's virtually no, and this may be fighting words for some of you, there's virtually no good examples, at least the way I define a good example, which I'll show you in just a second, of animal-mediated dispersal or pollination in the sea. Whereas in terrestrial environments, there are probably 200,000 plus species of insects, birds, bats, and other mammals that are specialized vectors for other organisms and their gametes. If we look at total angiosperm diversity in marine environments, I don't know, did I get this right? About 60 species of seagrasses, they're the only angiosperms that I know of. There are about three times that seagrasses have evolved. Can, come on, there are a lot of seagrass people here. <laughs> Speak up. Is that, is that pretty, is that roughly plus or minus? Okay. What's close enough? Yeah. All right, good. Um, I get, this is, these are the things I get really nervous about. That, you know, I'm not going to get out the door alive. <laughs> this, is, this is how you perish at the WSMU. <laughs> okay. All seagrasses are abiotically pollinated by, by water plants. On land, the overwhelming majority of plants overwhelming majority of angiosperm plants are biologically and biotically pollinated. Roughly 290,000 species of angiosperms are biotically pollinated in terrestrial systems, and relatively few, about 10,000 species, are abiotically pollinated, wind or water pollinated. And if we look at herbivores in the sea, there are really relatively few real specialists, especially in the sense that we see herbivore specialization in terrestrial environments, especially tropical terrestrial environments. Okay, so let's explore this question of animal-mediated dispersal for just a second, and in fact, I'm gonna explore it for just more than a few seconds. So, if we wanna know why there are so few species in the sea, there are, I, I can think of four sort of general classes of explanation. One is, there's just not as much productivity per unit area in the sea as there is in terrestrial environments. So vegetation on roughly 29% of the Earth's surface, that's land, fixes the same biomass as all marine primary producers. Another possibility is that there are weaker barriers to dispersal in the sea, so genes move around more easily in the sea than they do on land. That makes it much more difficult for local populations to become adaptively specialized, genetically, genetically um, diverged, and form new species. And I just have highlighted, you know what the iconic barriers are to gene flow? We all know the Isthmus of Panama is one of them. We all know who, what they are. And then we struggle to identify those other barriers to gene flow. And I think we're doing a better job of identifying them and sort of putting ourselves in the world of the organisms that are experiencing them in aquatic environments. And I'll talk about it, that at the very end of the talk. But still, it's easier for genes to move around in the sea. A third possibility is there are more limited opportunities for resource specialization in the sea. Um, and there are more specialists on land, we know that, especially consumer specialists. There are more dispersers, animal-mediated dispersers, pollinators, and parasites and pathogens. But that's not really a good answer because it's not a why answer, it's almost just an observation. And then the fourth possibility is the way that, in fact, if you look at the lower right panel there, that's the way that non-marine people, not us, the other people, often sort of portray what the ocean looks like. And so, and then they show you a tropical rainforest and they say, hey, there's way more structural complexity and habitat complexity in terrestrial environments than there is in marine environments. That allows uh, for, that provides a lot more physical niches for diversification to take place. But I don't buy that, you will see why. 
Okay. Let's go back to some really basic ecology here for just a second. This is a Whitaker plot, plot or it's a rank abundance curve. And I hope most of you are familiar with these rank abundance curves from introductory ecology. And the point I want to make for a fixed amount of energy input into a system, there's only a finite amount of biomass you can put into that system. And as you increase trophic efficiency, you can increase the amount of biomass. But there is a finite amount of individuals that you can fit in. And there's actually a finite amount of species given a fixed amount of production. And so these rank abundance curves, one of them compares tropical environments shown in blue here, whether it's a coral reef or a tropical rainforest. The one, the plot shown in red, shows a temperate environment. You can see roughly along the x-axis is the species rank, basically rank abundance, and the number of species. And the y-axis is the relative abundance. And you can see in both temperate environments and tropical environments that as species diversity increases, you see a general pattern where are, there are lots of rare species, numerically rare species, and relatively few abundant species. And that seems to be a pattern that's characteristic of every community and every ecosystem on this planet. So more diverse communities, almost by definition, have fewer common species and lots of rare ones. As a digression here for just a second, almost everyone in all the conservation talks I heard today and yesterday, most of them deal with anthropogenically driven rarity in the system. So we focus our attention on species and ecosystems that we've damaged in such a way that we take what were once abundant organisms, plants, animals, and microbes, and we reduce their abundance. There's been remarkably little work on what Gary and I have called chronically rare species, species that have evolved to be rare, and they actually have to be not numerically abundant as individual species, but the most common kind of species that there are in diverse systems, and we know remarkably little about them. I don't advise you, especially younger folks, as a career strategy to write a grant, NSF, to study a chronically rare species, saying something like only five of them have ever been observed in the history of humankind, um, and I want a 100-year grant so I can figure out how they came to be rare. It's something for people at my stage in my career to get a little bit obsessed with, but we know remarkably little about the tactics and the strategies and the traits that allow chronically rare species to persist over evolutionary time scales. And yet it's gotta be really important and a really important explanation for the persistence of diversity in diverse communities. Okay, so let's first ask this question about rarity and chronic rarity. And we often think about rarity as being a disadvantage, but in fact, from an ecological perspective, rarity can be a huge advantage to you as an individual. For example, competitors, predators, and pathogens provide biotic incentives to be specialized and rare. If you're rare, you're hard to find. I mean, even just in space and time, you may be hard to locate. And so it may make you an unattractive target for a specialized predator. So in other words, rarity in and of itself may not be as much a liability as we often imagine it to be. 